Support for this episode of Judaism Unbound comes from the Oshman family JCC in Palo Alto, California, whose vision is to be the architects of the Jewish future. The Oshman family JCC is an incubator for new expressions of Jewish identity. It creates innovative Jewish learning, celebrations, and arts programs that inspire personal connections to people and ideas from across the Jewish world. Learn more at www.paloaltojcc.org. This is Judaism Unbound, episode 113, Embrace the Weird. Welcome back, everyone. I'm Dan Liebenson. And I'm Lex Rothberg. And we are continuing our exploration of spiritual entrepreneurship, specifically looking at organizations that have been working over the last year with the innovation department at Klal, trying to develop new approaches to creating meaningful Jewish community and Jewish organizations. Our guest today is Miriam Cherlinchamp, the rabbi of a small but growing congregation in Cincinnati, Ohio, called Temple Shalom. The story of Temple Shalom is truly extraordinary, and we're excited to get into it. Just to give you a little bit of a teaser, Miriam Terlinchamp was the rabbi there for a few years when she realized that the synagogue had to do some extraordinary things to turn itself around and explore new directions. She led the synagogue to sell its building and its land, put half the money in a lockbox, used the other half to reimagine the way that a synagogue should work without owning a building, and she is now leading the synagogue to become a hub of social justice work. Temple Sholem has documented its extraordinary journey with a series of equally extraordinary high-quality videos that we'll link to in the show notes, but I strongly urge you to go and look at these videos. They are truly something special, and they document the journey of Temple Sholem from the idea of selling the building and taking a new direction through where they are now, and they also include a number of other videos about typical things that synagogues have to deal with, typical things that all organizations have to deal with, all kinds of really wonderful videos, and we'll talk to Miriam about why they started to create them. Miriam Turlenchamp grew up in Seattle, Washington at a conservative synagogue where her mother was the executive director. She took a detour for a number of years to study art and work in that field. She was a graphic designer for a while, but eventually decided to become a rabbi and was ordained from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion of Reform Judaism. Before coming to Temple Shalom, Miriam Turlenchamp was a chaplain at the Los Angeles County Men's Jail and the Los Angeles Home for the Aging. In addition to being the rabbi at Temple Shalom, Miriam Turlenchamp is currently the president of the Amos Project, the largest faith-based organizing body in Ohio, with 55 Cincinnati area congregations as members. She is active in the Ohio Organizing Collaborative and serves on several boards and committees within the Cincinnati Jewish community. And in addition, she is working to create Just Love, a multi-faith movement provoking love and action. Miriam Turlenchamp, welcome to Judaism Unbound. We are are thrilled to explore the story of Temple Shalom and your social justice work with you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. It's great to be here. This is one of those cases where our guest is a media star in her own right. We have really enjoyed the videos that you've made, and I'm looking forward to jumping into that topic later in the conversation. But I thought it would be really great to open with your professional project, right? The one that actually uh, I think you're drawing a paycheck from, which is being the rabbi of a synagogue in Cincinnati, Temple Shalom. And you have really done some remarkable things with that temple. And um, I I think it's things that our listeners would be really surprised to understand that the depth to which a synagogue is going to in reimagining what a synagogue is all about and how to go about the business of being a synagogue and how to make some really challenging decisions that help the synagogue make sure that it's doing what it needs to be doing and and doing it best as it can. So I was wondering if you could just walk us through a little bit of the story of, let's say, you know, how you came to Temple Sholem and how and and what happened, you know, what because our listeners will have no idea what the story of Temple Sholem is. So could you give us a little bit of that story and then some sense of uh, of of how you came to go on a uh, on a path that uh, not too many synagogues yet have taken? When I took the job at Temple Sholem, I had never been to the Midwest before. I'm West Coast all the way and grew up in Seattle and was trained in Los Angeles. So when I got to Ohio, I was like, this is the most foreign place I've ever been. And my dad lived in Brazil at the time. So it's not like I hadn't been other places. It was just culturally really different. And when I saw Temple Sholem, it was dying by every traditional standard. We had lost, we'd 
bled people actually. It was just, we were half the size that we had been 10 years beforehand or five years beforehand. We were running out of money and our building, which was 30,000 square feet on six acres, was at the height of its beauty in like 1992. So it was suffering and I was fresh out of school and I thought, okay, I might go there and shut it down, but it won't be my fault. Or I'll go there and I'll get to build something great and maybe it will be because of me. And in the end, it wasn't because of either of those things, but it allowed me an opportunity to be creative. And so I took the job and I thought, all right, I'll be here for a couple of years and we'll see how it goes. And uh, we started changing things immediately and we didn't see any change. Like it didn't grow. It didn't do anything. So I was uh, visiting my mom. She uh, was getting an award and my cousin had made a video for her. He's a, a he makes films in Los Angeles. And well, after I watching the movie that he had made for her, I said, well, I wish we could do that for my Sunday guy. He's like, oh, Miriam, I'll come out there and do it for you. And at that point, I'd been there about three years and, and I wasn't feeling like we were moving at the pace we needed to move. And so he came and he, he tried to research and talk to people and see what our message was or our branding would be. And he comes back and he's like, Miriam, there's like, there's nothing original about you guys. So I told my congregation, I was like, you guys, we have nothing to offer. There's nothing unique about us, <laughs> except that basically we were like the nerds on the street. Like we, and not like the cool nerds, like the ones that no one wants to have lunch with. And I was like, we're never going to be like the cool ones, but we could be Portlandia. Like we could change and embrace the weird and be bold with that and then figure out how to run with that. And then here's the sort of aggressive nature of me is that we, uh, my cousin and I ended up making this movie and it was our first movie and it was about vision. And if you don't have like a cheeky sense of humor, you would think it's like the lamest thing ever. It was a ball passing on because he kept saying, well, if you didn't have this burden or that burden, if you, if you didn't have trouble getting members and if your people were younger and if you had the money, what would it be? And so I would like joke with him and just wax philosophical and he started filming it. And then we cast people who were great supporters of the synagogue, but weren't so excited about what was happening in the synagogues. We cast them complaining about things. And so if you see the movie, you'll see parts where I'm interrupted by my amazing president at the time. And she's like, we just have to build more on our building. Like that will fix things. And there's a one point where my treasurer at the time is telling me how I should recruit millennials, why I'm fixing the toilet. And you know, we just like joked like that. We turned it into this movie and then we showed it to them at the annual meeting and they had no idea it was coming. And at the end of the movie, we say that the building speaks and says, I'm your, I'm your inheritance, sell me. And that's how we began that conversation of what would it mean if we had the capital of, from our building and could use it to invest in the future. And I wasn't interested in selling and just putting the money into a new place. That was a really big deal to me, that we needed a vision and a plan. And so we came up with uh, seven mission statements, basic short mission statements of how we were going to affect a missional community in the Jewish world and basically what would set us apart. And, and basically all we have the word spiritual in front of them, but how do you spiritually spend, right? At that point, we were 80% of our budget was being spent on infrastructure and we wanted to flip the percentage within five years. So everything was based on five years. We wanted to grow as a community in terms of uh, numbers, but also in terms of differences, like embrace Portlandia, and expand our arms really broadly and not just by putting stickers on the window, but really actively searching out to build uh, Portland and Cincinnati. But now we're in this place where we've grown 10% every year. We've completely changed our financial model and our, our percentage of, of age and demographics and inclusion are through the roof. So my understanding of uh, what your story is on, on just sort of very basic, okay, here's what happened level, is that you came in 2010 and, like as you described, until 2013, you know, sort of uh, you're just kind of going about trying to wrap your mind around being a rabbi of a congregation. And then this this whole story began with your cousin in the, the movie. Um, and I guess that, right, so so my understanding as an outsider is that essentially you inherited a synagogue that had a building that was built for about 400 families, and you, um, and, and am I right in understanding that what you ultimately, what the community ultimately decided to do was to sell the building 
and the land sort of to completely monetize the value of the building. Can you tell me, tell us a little bit about the story of exactly sort of what you did and how it freed capital? So I think it's the extra part, like the weird part of what we did is I was totally uninterested in selling the building and land just to go and buy more building and land. That was uninteresting to me. And I actually said, I was like, you guys, you need to sell this no matter what. It needs to happen. And if you want to go do that and just downsize into another space, you're welcome to. I will encourage you. I will support you, but I will not be with you. I will leave if that's what happened. And it wasn't a threat. It was just like, we're in different ways. So there's been different points in our synagogue history where we've had that conversation really honestly. What we did is we sold the building the land. And we took half the proceeds and put them into an account we couldn't touch so that it could grow as fast as it could. And we put all these protections in it. So if we break it before five years, we have some kind of penalty. And at seven years, it frees up again. So we made it, so we protected it from ourselves. And the other half, the agreement was that we get to spend all the way down in five years. So we planned on a deficit for five years that we were gonna take that whole half of the proceeds and invest into a vision. So it's pretty high risk. And then we built in one place at two and a half years, which is exactly where we are right now, where if we weren't hitting specific measured goals and it looked like we were bleeding money or something like that, that they could stop the plan pull that money out, spend it on the building, fire me, all that out, so that there was a one fail safe in there. But it, it was a pretty big jump for a congregation to do. When you have things like, like services and religious school or whatever your version of that is, and we'll get to that, where does that actually take place? So I'm going to give you two answers to that question. One is the simple, easy answer, and one's a longer one. We are currently in an office park in a suburban area of Cincinnati that has a lot of Jews in it. It fits about 130 people for services. It has four classrooms. It has a boardroom and office space. It's pretty minimal. We rent. Um, we thought we'd be here five years, so we we redecorated so that we'd have five years of growth in it. And we're at two and we already know we probably won't be able to last for another year in here. So that's, you know, the problem like being too pretty. It's like, oh, we're too big for our space now. <laughs> the longer answer to that is that looking at neighborhood and spacing was really difficult. In Cincinnati, all the reformed communities are within about 10 minutes of each other. And we actually were on synagogue row. So there's four synagogues within two blocks of each other. And so there was this presumed expectation that all the Jewish community lived in a certain area. And I really wanted to go back to Roselawn, which was a Jewish area in the 60s. And then with white flight, it became a predominantly black area. And if you go into the areas, it has, um, you see mezuzot still on the, you see Jewish scrolls on the doors that have been painted over. And there's this huge JCC. The Jewish Community Center with this big pool with a Jewish star in the middle of it that is now a black Black Baptist Church, and I really wanted to share space with them. So I worked really, really hard to share space with them, and my community in the end just wasn't ready. So I said, "Okay, guys, let's um, let's let's go to the suburban easy area for now. But I'm I'm gonna come back here. We're gonna come back to this area, and and start this healing process between our communities. The most amazing part of our story, I would say, is that when we moved, we lost two percent of our population. Like we. We lost some people, but not very many. Most of us stayed with us. The biggest changes we had in terms of population and affiliation happened with our justice work, not with our change for building, not with leaving the due structure behind, not with getting rid of membership. That didn't, we didn't lose any one of those things. And I think it's because once we made the decision, we continued to check in with each other, that, that our listening campaigns went on cyclically. We were constantly listening to each other and saying, we're still here, right? We're still here, right? Like we're in the middle of the seas and we're looking for promised land, but it was hard. And I think that we're in this amazing moment in our Jewish world right now where we don't know what's going to happen in the next generation, but we've got the next 20 years where we're moving from sort of this cusp to the next cusp. And it's our job to imagine this moment, not, not really what's going to happen 50 years from now, but just like what's happening right now and that we actually can do something about it. But I think just saying that over and over again, we're just going to do this, not for the next generation either, just for us, like just for the Jews who are here right now. Let's just figure it out for us in this moment, and then we'll figure out what's on the other side. And that conversation just seemed to work. 
So talk to us. You, you've you used what I love as a metaphor or role model a few times, Portlandia and like Portland and Cincinnati. And I want to make sure that for any listeners who are who maybe they have a sense what you're getting at, um, I, I'd love to make sure that everybody knows what you mean by that. So like wh- when you say that you're looking to Portlandia and, and to Portland and Cincinnati, what do you mean by that? And how how are you able to start taking steps towards towards becoming that? So the biggest issue that my congregation faced when I assumed the role as their uh, spiritual leader was that they weren't proud of themselves. They had a really bad morale about who they were. And so they weren't recruiting anyone because they didn't like themselves either. And so our biggest, our first marketing effort was really internal. Like, why are you here? Why are you still here? Why do you want others to be here? And, uh, that's where I sort of found that a lot of the people who came to our congregation were people from other parts of our country and world, which is a little unusual in Cincinnati. When you ask someone in Cincinnati, where did you go to school? They mean their high school. They don't mean someplace else. And so since it turns out Temple Sholom, it turns out that Temple Sholom was a place where if you weren't of here, you could still belong here. And that our particular niche was belonging being a new tribe, really, for those who had no tribe. And so when I say we're like Portlandia, I meant to fully embrace the weird, to celebrate it, and to welcome fellow travelers who are like you. And so when you come to a service here, there are tattoos, there's piercings, there's a lot of queer folk, um, different races, economic statuses. And we say we want all those things. Uh, All of us say we want those things, but it's really hard to live it. And we were already living it before I did anything about it. The hardest movie for me to release, but actually every movie we've released, I have freaked out about. And I'm like, we're going to lose our jobs, we're going to lose our jobs, like every single time. But there was one called The the Way We've Always Done It, Demon. And if you see the cover, it's like this guy covered in green. I mean, it's super freaky. And I was like, you know, sometimes you make art and you put it in the world and everyone hates it, but it was your truth and your art. And I was like, this is Temple Shalom in a nutshell. Like, we just put weird, weird, like, Gollum, freaky movies out there about change. And it works for us. And then it turned out that that was the one that got the first time, I think, we had 400,000 viewers. And I was like, man, there's a whole Jewish community of weird people wanting to listen to weird and celebrate that. And we're not alone in this, that we have a really wide community that wants to hear this message. You know, it's so interesting because it feels like uh, in a way that I wasn't sort of expecting to know that we would be talking about it. But um, when you think about the structure of the Jewish community of the 20th century, a lot of it was defined by geography. You know, well, this is why do we need to have, you know, eight reform synagogues in a city, for example? You know, it's like was there's eight different neighborhoods or I guess in your in Cincinnati's case, there isn't even they're all in a row. So I'm not even sure what the answer is. But the um, but, you know, there's some some reason why our services are a little different or whatever. And um that what you're describing is sort of a new way of of organizing Jewish life. I can even imagine that people, and maybe they they do, right? People join your synagogue who are not Reform um, because they gravitate towards the the sense of what this community is about, or they like the vibe, and it's not really about Jewish denominational ideology at all. And that you know, and I guess my question is whether you're sort of on the cusp of almost discovering through experimentation some new organizing principle for Jewish community. Well, that would be amazing. I think I hear this word a lot among my Christian colleagues and they say, oh, I'm trans-denominational. And I'm like, I want to be that. What is that? And I think that's probably what we're all co-creating in our own way. And I am thankful to my colleagues who are keeping the status quo in a really positive way. I don't mean that with any criticism because because of them keeping synagogue stable and the same, I'm able to experiment in a safe way. Because if I fail, it's just me. And my community can still go and join other congregations afterwards. They'll still have a Jewish home. But if they failed, I don't think I'd have the foundation to do it. That being said, I do think we're working towards something really different. I don't like organized religion. And I don't think that many of my age, people my age like it either. The idea of affiliating with an institution if the own rabbi of an institution feels that way, I can't even imagine 
the other people, non Kool-Aid drinking rabbis who <laughs> feel that same way too. And um, I just felt like I had two choices. One is leave institutional Judaism and go fly this flag someplace else or try to change it from the inside. So that's what we did. Actually, so that might be a good opportunity to get a little bit into your story because I've been intrigued by a rabbi who actually is leading a congregation who says she doesn't like organized religion or doesn't connect to institutions. So how did you even get into this business in the first place? Oh, so my mom is an executive director of a very large synagogue, conservative synagogue in Seattle. And uh, my parents divorced when I was a teenager and my mom was a single mother. And so every day after school, we'd spend the time in the synagogue and do our homework there. And I took my first jobs there and all those things. And I think that a lot of kids grow up, especially in the conservative world, very separate from their faith. It's some things sort of we use and come back to. And for us, like the synagogue was this place that had free cake after the bar mitzvahs and we hid in the ark for the great hide and seek. And it was just sort of like home in its own way. And yet I really saw how everything was made. So on high holidays, my mom was getting there at 5 a.m. and making sure the police were there and that there was toilet paper in the bathrooms and that the light is checked. And I thought, um, wow, congregational life is horrible. And I think that some kids rebel and do drugs. And in my family, you rebelled and became a rabbi. I fought it a really long time. Like I really didn't want to do it. I went to art school. I, I tried lots of other things. And... I'm a deeply faithful person, and I believe that I was called by God to serve my community, and that call just kept getting stronger. I just didn't know what the call of my rabbinate was until about three years ago. So up until then, I just knew I was called to the rabbinate, not more than that. So, okay, I want, I want to really hone in on a point that you made briefly, but that I think we haven't spoken about, but is like really widespread, which is this lack of self-confidence that you found in your community and almost like a shame around around congregational identity or like, because I've had an experience recently. So we, um, my wife and I, we live in Providence. So we shopped around to different congregations when we, when I first moved back here and we ended up deciding to join this dinky little Reconstructionist congregation in Attleboro, Massachusetts. And we decided to join. And one of the first times we were back, we, we went there a bunch of times before we joined. But um, one of the first times we went there after we joined, we mentioned we live in Providence, which is like a 20 minute drive. It's not far, but it's like a drive. And there's congregations in Providence we could have joined. And they're like, well, why did you join us? And it was this like devastating, tragic thing to me because I was like, well, this was somebody like on their board or in, involved very deeply in their community. I'm like, because you're great. Like, because this is a, a wonderful, tight knit little community that supports one another in a way that I, I didn't necessarily see. And not that the Providence congregations are bad, but like I, I felt seen in this small little place. And it was, you know, it, it was nice. And I, I identified all of these wonderful things about this community. And time after time in the Oneg conversations, people were like, really? You're like the young people and you're in Providence and you're coming here. Um, so I guess I just, you could talk about your community a little more if you like, but also to the general point uh, uh, that exists so many places, like what would you say to folks who think of their congregations as, you know, something they're not, su they're not proud of. They join because they're parents have been there or whatever the thing is, but like, how would you try and explain to people or help people identify what is special in their congregations? Or maybe how did you in, in that process you undertook? I mean, I wasn't very nice about it. I think that the lack of pride was just seeing loss instead of uh, a slendering down of an essential part of, I mean, part of, I think, why we didn't lose that many people in the move is because whoever wasn't, was going to leave left already. So what we had was people who was, people were going to stay and were committed to whatever it was going to be. I said to my community, I said, you know, no one wants to join us because it's sort of like no one wants to go on the date with the guy who doesn't have any self-confidence. Like, if you don't think you're cool, then why should I go out with you? Like, you got to go after, like, the greatest looking one over there. You have to believe that you can get that date. And uh, so we talked a little bit about that, and I just named it a lot. It was like, it's really not fun to be with people who don't think that they're interesting. 
It's just, it's not fun to be with people who don't believe that they're loved, especially when they're sitting in love of plenty. Like there's so much going on that should be loved. I think the confidence thing is not just uh, in our congregations. I think it's a systemic Jewish issue. I run into it with converts a lot. My husband's a Jew by choice. My father's a Jew by choice. That I'm connected to it. And I feel like many Jews are surprised when someone chooses Judaism. They're like, why? Why do you want to convert? And there's this line in the traditional conversion ceremony that says, we rejoice in welcoming into our midst one who willingly and devotedly helps replenish the ranks of our people. And I think about that, that in our conversion and our welcoming, we admit that we've lost something in the process and who would want to be part of us if we're the group that gets killed? Why would you want to do this? We have so many freaking holidays and weird restrictions. Why would you want to be part of us? And uh, especially when, especially in the reform community, when you don't need to convert, you don't, you don't need to, you can just live amongst us. Like you don't need to get married. You can just live together. And I think that starts at our source that we don't know why people actually want to be us. I'm, I'm flashing to a conversation we had way back when with Pico Union Project, actually, this experimental, interesting community in California, um, in LA. And they were talking all over and over about love your neighbor as yourself. And they like hammer it, hammer and hammer. And what they were saying is in order to love your neighbor, you have to know your neighbor. But there's another side of it, which is in order to love your neighbor as yourself, you have it implies you need to love yourself. Like, like loving your neighbors yourself means nothing if you don't love yourself. It, it just means you neutral your neighbor. Um, and I feel like that's important to keep in mind in the in this sort of self confidence teaching that you're giving us. Um, sh- shifting maybe, but also not shifting. I'd love to hear just a little more. What are some of these videos you've done? You, you you've mentioned that video production has become a big part of what you do, both internal marketing and externally. What are some sort of highlights for folks? And we'll also have these. Um, for those of you listening, these are on our website in the show notes for this episode. But um, what are these videos that you've created and what have been some like ongoing themes in them? I think the important thing to explain before I go into these videos is that most synagogues spent 1% or less of their budget on marketing. We spend closer to 8 to 11%, depending on exactly what we're doing that year, which is more in line with most small businesses. And the first year was all for internal marketing, trying to raise awareness and being able to sell our vision to ourselves. And I did that with videos and we did it with letters. And then we also have these beautiful color printouts that are in all our bathroom stalls. From there, we started realizing that our message was more universal. And at first it was self-serving. We have an online community and um, we wanted higher awareness and we wanted to get some income from that online community. So we put out something at High Holidays that was fun. And that year, all of our High Holiday needs were paid for by our online community. So that was the first time we got sort of a taste of what it could be. We created these videos and we continue to create them. So we create somewhere between four and six high-end videos a year and then lots of small ones internally because we never let go of the internal stuff. That's always the number one. And then match what you're saying in your video to what you're doing. So if you're like, it's the most innovative, interesting, creative place in the world and so musical and fun. And then they walk in and it's like, wah, wah. You, you can't do that. It has to always match your actions. And that takes time. But we realized that we had a missional resource here that we could get a Jewish message or just have a faith message or a meaning message out there. And then we only cast members of our community. And now it's awesome to go from they never were able to speak on camera to everyone knows how to mic up. They understand the takes. They understand lighting. I mean, they really like learn this whole new skill and it's people of all different ages. And uh, we've sort of upped the ante in terms of being able to articulate ourselves and be able to deliver messages and Jewish messages at that. So when they can go into other places and speak about us, they understand our mission very clearly because they've had to do it 8,000 times for the camera. On complicated things, like the way we've always done a demon or a little table or um, someone else, we tend to cast people we've had the issue with. So I say, hey, I, Plony person, you and I have struggled on this issue before. Would you act in this? Like, what would you say in this? And we like we figure out the problem that the two of us have had or the congregations had with each other. And we write that part together. So in the end, we've, we've fixed our relationship in some way where we've healed that particular wound. 
And at the meantime, we've done this weird, funny thing and shared it with the world, but internally it created some health. And then I went through a phase where I was making study sheets. And so if people wanted to use them for their boards, they could do them like no one wanted to do them. So that, that wasn't very successful. They just want to push play. Uh, and now we have this uh, large non-Jewish following. So that's been interesting of, uh, of moving from synagogue to faith-based organizations to just nonprofits and how that works. Could you tell us a little bit about where you are now, five years into this process, in terms of some of those standard measures, you know, how many families are there now, et cetera, and whatever you think is important. And also, can you give us a little bit more color on what it is that you're now doing differently as a synagogue? The biggest change is that there was some stuff that happened a couple of years ago and the age has changed. So we didn't necessarily grow in terms of people, but the types of people change. So it was like a blood transfusion that happened. So our average age went from upper 60s to closer to the 40s. Um, for example, we had no one in K first grade or second grade the first few years that I was there. And this year, our kindergarten class is 14 kids. So that's sort of an example of how we've changed. Uh, programming is, is changes by about 15 to 20 percent each year. So we've had huge changes there. And uh, financially, we've raised 10 percent more this year than we did last year. It's sort of true each time. We've doubled our endowment. We had I think 10 legacy gifts beforehand, maybe a little less than that. And now this year, I think we have 33. So the first thing that we started to do is change our welcoming before it was like fresh meat walking through the door and they would just like sick on them like wolves. And I was like, that doesn't feel welcoming. That feels like an attack. And we worked really hard on welcoming. And one of the things we've done for the last five years or six years is something we call shul and fuel. Now this would only really work in a liberal environment, but, um, I think it's the most successful thing that we do, and that's um, every day after services, we say, where's the restaurant? And they pick a local restaurant that's affordable, and it's just shul, and then they go to fuel. And about 75% of the people who come on Friday nights will go out to dinner together, and it's like built-in engagement. It's built-in something that you can do. It's affordable, and so we did nothing to make it happen, and it's like a fun part of the services um, that people look forward to. You know, we did some of the standard things in terms of education and just upped our ante in terms of what we were offering. And we live in a city with HUC, so uh, the Hebrew Union College, so we have wonderful teachers that are available to us. And then we do a lot of justice work, and uh, from small to large, and that seemed to really affect what we were doing and how we were doing it. Um, and uh, one thing that we did is that we changed our entire board structure. So... We said right now, everyone, the youngest person on our board was 50, and he was the youngest by 10 or so years. And he's like, this can't be that way. And so what we did is we moved our board meetings to quarterly. They're on Sunday mornings for two hours, and they're only vision-driven. We got rid of almost all of our committees, and we moved to teams. So now when you ask someone to do something, you pick one or two other people. So there's two or three person teams with one-year assignments. So there's none of this two years and then going to the next year. It's all very small missional things that are accomplishable. And what happened in the two years that we started that is that we flipped the ratio of age and demographic on our board. I feel like a lot of folks, when thinking about, you know, synagogue change or synagogue priorities, it's sort of like, well, we could try to go the young families route or the young people route, or we could try to do like the justice route or we could try to do the religious school as I said, or, or the, the, it's sort of like you have to, like, by the sound of it, in making a lot of these shifts that people talk about, about I mean, you, you mentioned your board has gotten younger, but you also mentioned that, you know, justice is now a bigger part of what you do. Like, it sounds like these things have gone hand in hand in a really healthy way. And because we've, we've heard a little bit about the, the age change over, over the last few years that you've been doing all these other big changes. I'd love to hear what what does the justice programming that you do look like? Um, what does it look like for a congregation like yours to, to really step up its justice game? I want to answer that, but I want to answer something before I get to that. Cincinnati is an incredibly 
great place to be if you're Jewish and you're a Jewish institution because we have the Jewish Foundation of Cincinnati here who has offered seed money to those who are looking to do innovation. So a lot of what I have done, almost all of it is because of them. And my first time I pitched them, I said, I want to work with baby boomers. Like that's where it is. I thought they were more loyal. I thought they had money and I thought that they had more time and that that was the niche I was going to go after. So the first time I did it, I think it was a two year grant and I had to work for it. Like, I, I worked hard for it. And instead I got all these millennials and I was like, what? I don't want these guys. And, um, so I applied for it again. I was like, <laughs> this time, this time I'm going to get you baby boomers. And I got like millennials and young families. And then this whole LGBTQ, I, community. And I was like, all right, I'm really glad I got these people, but that's not what I was looking for. So I think that we say we want to go after something, we want to change and grow. And you have no idea. What, you don't know what you're getting and you don't know what you really want until it's sitting there in front of you and um, just trying a little bit and then saying, okay, this weren't the results I was looking for, but now what do I do with this particular mana? Like, what am I going to do with this act of grace and uh, how am I going to build from there? Um, justice. When the uprising started happening in Ferguson, I was really affected. And St. Louis is not that far from Cincinnati, but I, I had like been there once when I was young, and I didn't have any association with it, but I was really affected by it. Like I was obsessed with it, and I couldn't stop watching the news, and I, was play I just was so upset. And so I started going to this justice organization, and I was often uh, the only white person in the room. I was always the only Jew in the room. And at the end, they started trying to make it more ecumenical. So they'd say, okay, Rabbi, would you offer a prayer or a poem or whatever? And, you know, I'd oblige, but I didn't say anything ever in these spaces. And then there was this moment and uh, about a year of going to these events where they asked me to, to do the final prayer, like, you know, you normally in these places. And I'm a twofer as a young female, I'm Jewish. And so I got up to do it. And then the person who handed me the mic said, well, and say why you're here. Why do you care about this? And I think that was my second real call that I, I realized exactly why I cared about it and what was, why it was hurting my heart so much and what I wanted to do about it. And part of it is that my sister was in a really bad car accident when she was a Fulbright scholar. She was hit by a police officer in Seattle and uh, sustained a, a traumatic brain injury. It was very serious. And it wasn't a good situation. And the way my mother dealt with her anger about it was to sue everybody. Like she went after the police, she went after the state. They went and changed a bill that police officers now have to take a drug and alcohol tests after accidents. I mean, the way that my family dealt with injustice was to seek justice. And I realized, wow, my privilege as a white Jewish person who understands that we have a right to justice is so strong. And I'm connected to this in all these ways. And I came back to my community and I was like, hey, new sheriff's in town. We're going to change this. And um, we helped uh, pass Universal Preschool in Cincinnati. We had phone banks and organized it. It was all them. I just cared about it and preached hard about it. And they were amazing about it is like they let me yell at them. Like they let me deal with my grief over the situation and discovering this why and discovering this new painful call. Because I think the call of justice for the rabbinate it's pretty awful. Like, I wish the call to the rabbinet was like improving camp songs or Sunday school or something, something within my reach than racial economic justice for our world. Like, I just wish it was something I could do. And then the election happened in November. The day after the election, two thirds of my community reached out to me. And I wrote this email to the community and I was like, we can't tolerate this. There's so much grief in the world. Everybody show up at the mosque in an hour and we're just going to overflow that place with love. And they did. 60 of my people showed up and they were there. And, uh, you know, seven people left my congregation that day. And uh, it just continued mm. from there that there was a group of people who started to join and a group of people who started to leave. And it took me a while to find a voice of passion rather than a voice of fire. And the next step happened when we declared ourselves a solidarity congregation in the Sanctuary Coalition. We were founders of that here. And uh, 
a woman named Maribel Diaz was going to be deported. She's a mother of four children and was here illegally. She is on, a, on an ankle monitor and she got picked up and Ohio is not a great place to be if you're about to be deported. And we fought, like we just went, from the moment we got the call that she was going to be deported, 48 hours later, we had 500 people showing up and uh, we were meeting with our senators. We got our governor to agree. It was just incredible. And it was all during Passover, so it felt like so righteous and connected. And here was this true exodus. And if, if this woman was going to be deported, then who else could be deported? And I thought we we're going to do it. Like we were on the Rachel Maddow show. We were in the New York Times. I was like, we, our voices matter. And then she was deported anyways. And I don't think I ever cried as hard as I did in that moment. I was like, I couldn't believe how powerless I actually was. And um, so I sent another email, but this one was very different than the one I sent in November. And I said, okay, let's come together again. And all of us who were activists and tried, we need something too. And people showed up from all different faiths. And that's when Just Love was born. That's when this new organization was born. And I think of it in different ways. Someone once told me that it's spiritual sustenance for the resistance, <laughs> which I like and is also very partisan. And really what it is is just, it's justice work I think is 98% failure. You're just constantly losing. And it's very hard not to surrender to that feeling. And what Just Love does is create a liturgy for social justice. That's what I call it. We create original music and we have these spiritual gatherings once a month um, that are led by all different clergy. And then we have small activist groups that are working for systemic change. And we've built this body of people who show up regularly, much larger than who show up at my Shabbat services, who are from all walks of life and we're building justice in our community right now. Can you talk a little bit more about what spiritual sustenance for the resistance means and looks like? This is reminding me of an idea that, you know, those who go out and work for justice also need to care for their own spirit, even as they understand that the work of justice is itself spiritually uplifting. But I'd love to understand sort of what does this look like when translated into work on the ground? We, our name is Just Love, A New Way to Belong, in the sense that whether you're searching for faith or God or religious activism, whatever you're looking for, it probably boils down to finding meaning, relationships, and belonging. And we say that we're trying to empower human beings with the knowledge, inspiration, and spiritual support to form meaningful connections for the purpose of furthering justice in our world. And they say that, that I'm not talking, I mean, I think that it's great to do social action projects. We're part of a soup kitchen. We work in a shelter. All those things are incredibly important. But knowing that you can move the dial in systemic change and to do that from a faith-based perspective with a broad range of allies, I think fuels the spirit in that way. So the team for Just Love is myself as founder, and then there are three pastors. And, uh, you know, we do this joke. It's a, one is an African-American pastor, one is a gay pastor, and one is a white pastor who works in a Hispanic church. And then we also have a, a friend who is an imam. And so together we sort of are all the cliches put together. And um, I also think that through our little group of friends, We've been able to transform one another's perspective and just sort of opened our minds and our language and our assumptions about what people get in this world and then translate it back to our own communities. So on a basic level, what we do is we do community work within our congregations. So we sort of create these allied relationships and gather signatures and make phone calls and work towards very specific things. Like right now we're working towards uh, a ballot initiative on mass incarceration, but also creating relationships across traditional silos so that the Jews might say they care a lot about racial inequities, but they don't actually have any black friends. Well, let's make those black friends or vice versa. And um, I think the Passover season is always really interesting to me. We've done this a couple of years of having a freedom or open Seder, which I think is replicable across the country and people have been doing it since the 60s. We found ourselves taking leadership roles in ways that our synagogues and churches couldn't. So my congregation 
uh, is really strong on racial justice, uh, really strong in um, homelessness and food insecurity, but gun safety is not something that we touch. Well, Just Love can touch that though. And so there's these places that Just Love can speak from. I, I write a, a monthly article in the newspaper and often I do that under the heading of Just Love instead of Temple Shalom. Uh, and then we plan, we serve as arbiters in a lot of places when different justice organizations need help and need support and they need some place, someone who gets justice but isn't one of the other ways. I think clergy have a unique place they can spend in that and we do do that. Before we run out of time, I'm wondering if we could um, just go back to the, um, to the, to the hyperlocal for a minute because Lex and I have talked a lot over the years about this sort of aspirational belief that if more congregational rabbis were willing to stand up for justice and to make claims on Judaism, that it can't be understood or shouldn't be understood if it doesn't stand for the impulse and the requirement, the command to do justice and to lead justice, that that if rabbis actually said that in the strongest possible way, it would create a great, great interest in joining Jewish community and being part of that. And of course, it would also alienate some people. And it seems that for the most part, there is too much fear of alienating those people who definitely would be alienated and definitely would leave the congregation, that the fear of that is in the way of many rabbis doing what in their hearts they really would like to do, which is proclaim loudly that this that this is the only Judaism that's sort of worth being part of and that that would actually attract large numbers of people who right now feel that they're excluded because Judaism doesn't, in their view, or the Jewish institutions don't stand for what they stand for. And so then what's the point? So I guess I'm asking, how have you resolved that fear? I mean, how can, and you say that you paid the price, you know, how did you do it? I talk a lot about my why not what we're doing, but why I'm doing it, why we are as a synagogue exist in the first place. And if it's not for justice, then what is the point? If it's not for shared humanity, then what is the point? I have this Pentecostal friend who said that she, in her seminary experience, was taught that you shouldn't learn too much because too much learning quenches the burning. And I thought at first, like, no Jew would ever say that because we're like, more learning, more learning. And yet I think that that actually might be a little bit true for Jews, that we've been trained to intellectualize and to think through things and to question, but we haven't done a lot of feeling, at least not post-Holocaust, about connecting to God and God's path and also walking our walk. Like we're really good at thinking our walk and saying our walk, but walking our walk is really hard. And I have found that in my rabbinate, I only want people who want to be here. I want every Jew to have a home and to feel like they belong. And that might not be with me. I'm a really unique taste and that's not everyone's taste. So let me help you find a home that works for you. And to be confident that like those who will belong will belong with me and those who want to belong simply as else, I will help you get there and just embrace that mentality. And I, I, think, I think being really honest about the price is important that not just in people or security or uh, that you'll get increased hate mail and as a Jew, that's hard and all the things that go along with that. But also that once you start doing it, everything else starts to feel meaningless unless it's there. And so I found for myself, my rabbit has really changed that in order to be present in a moment, I have to be authentic. And that sounds so obvious, but it's really hard to walk through the world without that armor of my learning and my books, this is the way I'm supposed to be. But instead to be like, no, human to human connect. What do we need to build? What do we need to risk? Thank you so much for joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation and we're just really excited to to carry with us a bunch of the themes that came on and revisit it, you know, maybe with you again, but definitely with our future guests as well. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. 
It was a fun one for us as well, and we hope for all of you out there listening. To close out, we want to do what we do at the end of every episode, which is call out to those of you with your earbuds in, with your car radios on listening to us, and say, yo, be in touch with us. And there are a few ways for you to do that. First, you can head to our Facebook page, Judaism Unbound. You can also hit us up on Twitter at, at Judaism Unbound. You can send us an email at dan at judaismunbound.com or lex at judaismunbound.com. And you can hit up our website, judaismunbound.com. The last plug we like to make is that you can always support us with a financial donation, either on a one-time basis or monthly recurring basis. And you can do either of those at judaismunbound.com slash donate. So thanks so much for listening. And with that, this has been Judaism Unbound. <laughs>